It's interesting to me that is, you know, we keep thinking that we can continue to change and get healthier in this country by taking more and more drugs. It simply doesn't work. Right now in this country, we have between 10 and 15 million children taking the drug Ritalin for attention deficit disorder and for ADHD. And what we found basically is we've drugged these children into a stupor so they'll behave in the classroom, not even thinking about the long-term side effects of this drug on brain development. And Ritalin is a very dangerous drug. It's in the same category as morphine, opium, Percodan, and Demerol. And it's so much easier to correct a child's behavior by simply changing the way that child eats. Perfect example. Yesterday we were on the airplane and there was a young child on the plane. The mother was feeding it just mountains of junk food. And when we started taking off on the airplane to come up and do this presentation, the child just sat in there and just screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed for 30 minutes. Well, if you've ever, ever been on an airplane with a child that's screaming and screaming and screaming, you know that it's very, very rough to listen to that. But I told my wife, I said, well, the child's eating so much junk food that pretty soon he's going to have a hypoglycemic attack. He's probably going to pass out in his chair from all the sugar, and he'll be okay. Sure enough, about 20, 30 minutes later, the kid basically conked out from all the sugar that he'd eaten. Two hours later, the kid's up again right before we land, starting to scream again, wanting another sugar fix. And this is how we feed our kids on a regular basis in this country, and that's one of the reasons that our children are so unhealthy. And we're going to talk about that in detail throughout this entire series. In 1900, we ate fresh agricultural food. The fresh agricultural food was grown on a farm. I know my father was a farmer. My, my family was basically raised on a farm. My grandparents were farmers up in Iowa. And what we've learned is this, that when they were on the farm, they didn't use crops that had a lot of different types of junk added to the crops. They didn't have crops that basically were just, you know, completely modified with genetically engineered foods. They had crops that they could take corn after they planted the corn. They could take corn back out from the crop, several bushels of corn, and they could replant that corn and it would grow. Now with the genetic hybrids, it doesn't work anymore. And what we're doing is we're constantly adulterating the food supply, making it worse and worse and worse, causing more and more disease. Today, we process factory foods. We have mill our grains. We heat our foods. We have chemicals. Our lifestyles have changed. We eat for taste. We have fast foods. We have convenient foods. Again, as I mentioned, agricultural practices have changed. And all of this has caused uh, many of the health problems that we've had in the United States. And again, what do we do? We basically take the health problems and we cover them up by adding drugs to the health problems. For instance, let me give you an example. Nowadays, you have massive amounts of TV advertising that's dedicated to drugs. And the pharmaceutical corporations have found that they can basically take a drug product, they can hire a company to say the product is safe, get the product approved to the Food and Drug Administration, market it, and in many cases, we have horrible, horrible side effects, and the products are pulled back off the market. Let me give you a perfect example. This is an article that is from the Financial Times, Thursday, October the 6th, 2005. And if you look at the article, it says, New Broom Waits to Sweep Through the FDA. Now, what's interesting about this, let me read you this. It's talking about the problem with the FDA that they're suffering from an image problem. Well, the reason they're suffering from an image problem is because the products that they're promoting are killing people. So anytime you have products that kill people, there's a tendency to have image problems. I'm going to read you a quote from this. This could be a welcome news to the pharmaceutical industry, which is suffering from image problems and is struggling to find new drugs. It sees cancer drugs, I'm going to repeat this, it sees cancer drugs as a wellspring of opportunity. I'm going to repeat this. It sees cancer drugs as a wellspring of opportunity, both in terms of saving lives and increasing profits. So read with me here. Making cancer a manageable chronic disease like diabetes would mean patients living on these new drugs for years, if not decades. So they're not necessarily interested in curing the cancer. They want to make it manageable like diabetes so they can keep you on these expensive cancer treatment drugs for years, if not decades, according to this newspaper article from the Financial Times. Now, that's to increase the profits of the pharmaceutical corporation. You think, well, why is that happening? Well, the same folks basically own the pharmaceutical corporations, own the television stations, and what ends up happening is they basically are promoting all of these drugs that don't cure anything, but just continue to keep you sick over extended periods of time. In some cases, they may reduce some of the problems associated with the conditions, but they don't necessarily take care of the conditions. Watch the commercials on TV. They'll have a new drug that it's a painkiller, and it says basically if you take this drug, you're going to feel better, live better, have more energy, et cetera, et cetera. And at the very end, they'll give you a disclaimer. By the way, this product has been shown to cause sudden death. This product has been shown to cause allergies and internal bleeding and all of these other little problems that are associated with the drug rather than the condition that you have, in many cases, are worse than the actual condition. So learn, friends. Remember, you don't have to take drugs in most cases in order to stay healthy. Let me give you another example. 
I had a lady come into my office a few years ago. Her name was Barbara and her husband's name was Bob. And when she came into the office, they sat down beside me. And her husband told me in confidence that he was going to divorce his wife if I couldn't help her. And I said, well, Bob, that's bad. I said, uh, you know, you need a marriage counselor, not a, you know, not a nutritionist. And he goes, well, we've tried that. It hasn't helped. Her health is affecting every aspect of our relationship. She told me that she was suffering with the following conditions, that she had fatigue, insomnia, sinus trouble, indigestion, heartburn, constipation, allergies, bleeding gums, and headaches. She went on to tell me that she had stress, weak muscle tone, menstrual problems, PMS, back pain, varicose veins, and she was irritable, nervous, and depressed. When I did some testing on her, we found she had hypoglycemia. When we found she had hypoglycemia, I told her that we had good news for her because it would be easy to correct a lot of the conditions because a lot of her conditions were basically being caused by the low blood sugar or hypoglycemia because of her diet. And her response was very succinct. She said, well, why should I listen to you? Why should I do what you say? I consider myself to be healthy. And I said, Barbara, you've literally checked off everything on my health questionnaire form, and you're telling me that you're healthy. How are you defining health? And she said, I'm defining health because I don't have in the, in, the, in the following way. I don't have heart disease, I don't have diabetes, and I don't have cancer, so I consider myself to be healthy. So basically, in essence, what she was doing, is she was telling folks, as long as she wasn't dying from a degenerative disease and she could walk in an upright position on a downhill slope with a breeze to her back, I guess, that she was considering herself to be healthy. And see, and that's how a lot of people live. I mean, go to the grocery store, any grocery store you'd like, anywhere in the country, and watch what people buy and what they put in their carts. I'm amazed that people still buy white flour and white bread and milled grains and milled grain products. But it's in the grocery store product and in the shelves. Uh, for instance, let me give you an example. Look in your medicine cabinets. You're going to find anti-cough medicines, decongestants, inhalers, and acids, tranquilizers, aspirins, sedatives, painkillers. The list goes on and on and on. Now, let me share something with you. If you've got a problem with an upset stomach, you don't have a deficiency of an antacid. In most cases, these antacids interfere with acid production in the intestinal tract and in the stomach, and what ends up happening there is your body can't digest the food properly, and the conditions that you have simply grow worse. So antacids don't necessarily treat the problem, which is basically acid indigestion and gastric upsetness. It basically decreases the body's ability to produce the acid, which your body needs to digest the food. If you don't produce enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach, in most cases you have acid indigestion. Now, if you put antacids into your stomach which stop or prevent the production of hydrochloric acid, your body can't digest the food properly. And when that happens, you can't get the nutrients or the energy or the vitamins or the minerals or the essential fats or anything else from the food that you need if you can't digest it.